This Is Harley Quinn is a pretty great show for a lot of reasons, some of which I've talked about in a previous video, but more than that, despite its zany, gory, madcap appearance, it's a pretty intelligent show too, and today I'd like to unravel one of the show's many thematic layers. How does Harley Quinn understand class and socio-economic conditions, and how do these issues affect this world, our characters and the story? This is also the third Pillar of Garbage community video, and if you're new here, that means it's a topic suggested by and voted on by members of my awesome Patreon community. Once a month I run a poll and make a video on whatever the community chooses, and this month we're looking at class in Harley Quinn. And the way I want to analyse this is twofold. First, we'll take a look at the show more broadly, the way its settings and characters, both one-offs and mainstays, reflect ideas of class, and then we'll focus in on Harley herself and how her class, in part, determines her character. So let's get going. The first point I want to make is that DC, especially with the Gotham setting, has always had a strange relationship between class and crime. This strange tension is visible in what I like to call the Batman question. If Batman wants to stamp down on crime in Gotham, why does he dress up like a bat and beat people up instead of, I don't know, using that money for philanthropy, for revitalizing derelict and poverty-ridden areas, for outreach programs, scholarships and internships targeting society's more at-risk youth, or even lobbying politicians to introduce progressive measures at a higher level. Attempts have been made to answer this perennial question, some more convincing than others, but Gotham has more or less remained a pit of crime regardless. I don't want to get too deep into this, it's a Harley Quinn video after all, but it's worth establishing the fact that there are pre-existing difficulties in the way this show's setting understands class, crime, and the links between them. Personally, I think it comes down to an inherited set of beliefs and assumptions about the nature of crime and of criminals from the era of Batman's origins, without which the very fabric of the Batman world wouldn't work, or at the very least, it would be fundamentally different. Either way, the takeaway here is that when investigating how a show like Harley Quinn represents these topics, there's a lot of antiquated baggage baked into this world and these characters alongside the original writing and decisions made by the showrunners and the writers. In a sense, we have to read against the grain and be aware that a lot of the class dynamics and sociological features of the setting are grandfathered in, so our focus here should be on areas in which which Harley Quinn innovates and changes this world in novel ways. One example of a pre-existing trope that the series deploys in interesting ways is the goon. The goon, or henchman as encountered here, is a trope derived largely from the gangster or noir stories of the early 20th century, and it's present throughout superhero media, but perhaps nowhere more so than in Gotham City. Any criminal who's anyone seems to have a legion of goons at their beck and call, ready to break the law, fight, or even die at the behest of their boss. We as an audience tend to take this abundance of henchmen for granted. After all, they're baddies, right? Criminals. But in switching the audience's perspective from the side of law and order, of superheroes and sidekicks, to the viewpoint of the villains, Harley Quinn adds some fascinating nuance to the well-worn goon trope. Because when we're on the side of the goons, we can't ignore the obvious anymore. These are people. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is that if we view these villains as people, like you or I, then we also start to view crime as a job like any other. This is an idea Harley Quinn loves to play up. You've heard the expression, crime doesn't pay? Well, in Harley Quinn, crime not only pays, but it offers a company pension and stock options as a Christmas bonus. But this corporatization of Gotham's criminal underworld has some big implications when it comes to questions of class. Because if we view goons as people and not as tropes, then the role they fill in Harley Quinn's criminal microcosm of capitalism is as a servile underclass, just muscle, innately replaceable manual labor. Moreover, Harley Quinn really drives home the idea of a divide between goons and their bosses, between mere henchmen and real criminals. Goons get killed or locked away, whereas villains escape and return for the next story. This dynamic is nothing new, of course. It's the antagonistic bread and butter for much of the superhero genre. What's new, or at least less common with Harley Quinn, is the ongoing effort to wrinkle this trope, to complicate the idea of this faceless underclass, this endless supply of goons. I'm not talking about an outright rejection of this trope, sent as it is to the setting, but playing with it slightly. Like the way goons actually get to speak for themselves from time to time, and the way we get to see these henchmen without their leaders on more than a few occasions. Join me and we'll be doing million dollar heists in no time. 
Who's with me? Can't. Where's he? I got a family emergency. Uh, I, I, I have a thing. But the most interesting example of this playfulness to me can be seen in Harley's own crew. Harley doesn't have goons in the traditional sense, but she does lead a small cadre of disgraced or forgotten supervillains. Clayface, King Shark, Dr. Psycho, and later Cyborgman. At one time or another, most of these guys have the same villainous stature as Harley herself, but in the show, they choose to work for our heroine. Later on, when Harley joins the Legion of Doom, though, we see them downgraded to goon status. And here we are. No, 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 I know this place. This is where they keep the goons and the henchmen. Right. Like you. Even Dr. Psycho, who'd previously held an office in the Legion, is reduced to a mere henchman and placed in a communal pool of utterly disposable bodies for the Legion of Doom's corporate partners to abuse as they see fit. A description you might notice which fits agency staff in the manual labor sector just as well as it does these fictional henchmen. What we learn here then is that in Harley Quinn, a divide exists between goon and villain, but this divide is a social construct, one which we see being constructed and deconstructed throughout the show. Show. Goonhood is not some inherent essential quality, but a designation to be conferred on an individual, perhaps against their own will, by their system of employment. I filed all the proper paperwork. I even got the green light from HR, so... Your move. If, as suggested earlier, we are to view the criminal economy of Harley Quinn as a satire upon our own economic systems, if these goons are a working class or an underclass, then the message here is surely a reminder that these real-life cultural and economic distinctions which shape our society are similarly non-inherent, non-essential designations propagated and enforced by those who benefit from them. To be sure, Harley Quinn often plays the goon trope straight. Dang. Back to the claim. This is Two-Face territory! And this show is certainly not some serious systematic critique of class and employment. Just look to the way Ivy targets blue-collar workers without a second thought. But the goon-villain divide is something the show has fun with. And there are signs here that every now and then, the show is, at the very least, thinking about class, crime, and economics in interesting ways. And from time to time, we get kinda awesome moments. Like the way Harley rebuilds her crew, doing away with the Legion's goon designations for King Shark, Psycho, and Clayface. Reassert Asserting that in her little corner of this criminal economy, workers aren't expendable and are actually valued. It's not quite a transcendence of class altogether, but if you squint, it's kinda similar. So far we've perhaps been reading against the grain, but I think that will change in this next section, because I want to continue by considering an episode which gets to the heart of the role class plays in Harley Quinn, perhaps more so than any other, Bensonhurst, which chronicles Harley's disastrous return to the Quinzel homestead, which as the name suggests is in Bensonhurst, New York. The episode tells us this version of Harley's backstory and shows us the environment which determined the course of her life, before bringing the new and improved Harleen Quinn into conflict with these factors and traumas in the present day. It transpires that a formative event in Harley's life came when her father forced her to throw an important acrobatics competition because he'd bet against her. He's a bit of a deadbeat, in and out of jail, and even to this day, he's involved with the mob. It's not entirely clear, but it seems his criminal involvement started out of desperation, before he got greedy and developed a taste for shady dealings. And this desperation is important, because it's one of the indications this episode gives us that Harley originated from a lower class background, and that this background was immensely important in determining the course of her life. After all, if you look at the real world statistics, Bensonhurst is considered a low income area compared to the rest of New York City, and in the episode the Quinzels seem to have recurring money problems. Indeed, the catalyst for much of this episode's plot is a mob bounty on Harley's dad. The implication here then is that Harley fought her way into university and into the psychiatric field as a way to escape these issues. The first time Harley's origin story was revealed in the wider DC world was in the graphic novel Mad Love, which has her university attendance come as a result of a gymnastic scholarship. But after the marring of her athletic record we see in the show, I think it's reasonable to assume that in this universe she must have got into college off her own back. Education is traditionally considered one of the major roots of social mobility, and I think we see in Bensonhurst the suggestion that Harley's education and qualification, which of course led to her posting at Arkham, is an indirect response to the dicey financial situation of her youth, and the slippery slope into criminality it presented. Sure, Harley ends up a sort of criminal anyway, but that's due to comic booky reasons, not social or economic pressures like her dad. And as we see throughout this show, 
Pre-Joker Harley, the psychiatrist remains an important part of her character. This points, I think, to the way that this episode and the show as a whole uses class in service of character. As we've noted above, Harley Quinn is aware of class issues and occasionally explores them in interesting ways. But you know, it's hardly 1984. These issues are not at the forefront of this series' consciousness. It's more interested in other things, like femininity or this unique pastiche of DC mythology or character. So when this episode does approach topics of class, it isn't really seeking to make any specific points or arguments about class directly. It's more interested in using social and financial considerations to strengthen the story and bring these cartoon characters to life in our minds. One example of this dynamic can be seen in Harley's arrival to the family home, where we see something resembling code switching take place. You know, sometimes I use the express line when I have more than 12 items. Oh yeah, that's truly evil of your mom. Harley reverts to a strong Brooklyn accent to interact with her family, in contrast to the less regionalized dialect this version of the character tends to favor. This seems to signal a regression to a past version of Harley's identity, before she cut off familial ties, before before she left home, back when she was just Harleen Quinzel, living in this poorer area of Brooklyn. Strong regional accents are often a stereotype of the working class, and given the wider picture of the Quinzel's life in Bensonhurst that this episode paints, I think that the accent's reappearance does play a role in the way this episode explores the sociology of Harley's early life. When this version of Quinn was introduced, there was a small amount of fan unhappiness with the lack of this accent, which had been a part of most iconic depictions of this character previously, including her introduction in the 90s Batman animated series. Kaylee Kuoko's Harley didn't speak in quite the same way, and I don't think that's an issue, but it's nice to see the show using this accent in some capacity, especially since it's a subtle non-verbal and non-visual indicator of the psychological journey the character goes on during this episode, especially when it disappears again at the episode's close. Reading Harley's backstory as a tale of upward social mobility, leveraging education to escape undesired financial and social conditions, also offers a deeper understanding of the way her family eventually turns on her. While Harley was able to uplift herself, her family seemingly wasn't. Listen to what her mum says here, for instance. It's been hard times. We were scraping by. I tried to get into real estate, but you know how much a pantsuit costs? Three figures! It's a joke, but it also isn't a joke. What's being acknowledged here is the simple truth that socioeconomic barriers and classes are maintained largely through the costs and prices which might seem trivial to those above them, but aren't really feasible risks to take for those lower down the ladder. See Terry Pratchett's famous Boots theory of socioeconomic unfairness for a similar principle. And class is about money, but it's also about culture. The fact that Harley has left her family's Bensonhurst bubble seems to be another factor driving a wedge between her and her parents, magnified greatly by their community's lack of acceptance for her different path. That's why people spit at us at the grocery store. When you became Harley Quinn, we became the laughing stock of the neighborhood. Oh, oh, I'm the the end result of all of these little points of contention between present-day Harley and her parents, who have remained entrenched in a lifestyle, culture, and class that Harley had attempted to escape, is a total breakdown of family ties, as her parents end the episode by attempting to collect a bounty on Harley's head. Partly this is because Harley's parents are finally revealed to be, at their core, toxic and greedy. But part of this is also inarguably due to the way that their now divergent class identities have torn apart their interpersonal connections. Class and economic status often drives family closer together, especially in times of hardship, but what we see here suggests that the opposite is true too. That under capitalism, the power money holds over us and the influence wielded by socially constructed categories such as class is enough to infiltrate and destroy even the closest of bonds. One thinks of Marx's conception of commodity fetishism or Jameson's writing on postmodernism, both of which explore ways that capital perverts personal connections. But that's getting to a level of abstraction which the material frankly doesn't encourage. And again, that's because Harley Quinn considers class but uses ideas like socio-economic barriers and social mobility primarily to flesh out its characters and to propel Harley's journey forward. While class is relevant to a discussion of Bensonhurst, it's clear that the show is more interested in using Harley's confrontation with her past life in this episode first and foremost as a way to drive her character development. For instance, to instill the lesson that family 
Harley can be fickle, especially when money's involved, and that Harley's chosen companions are the more important parts of her life. But this sense of class in service of character is still engaging and interesting on a conceptual level, because in giving attention to topics like these and the way they determine yourself and your life, the show speaks to the deep and penetrative way that class and socio-economic factors affect our existence. The B-plot of Bensonhurst is also worth mentioning, because it happens to reinforce some of the broader ideas we were discussing earlier about the criminal economy and the class politics of goonhood in Harley Quinn. Ivy gets kidnapped by Scarecrow while en route to destroy a factory, and spends this episode interacting mainly with one of his goons, who is drastically humanized in the process. Oh, oh god, I gotta take this. It's a parent from the skull. Hey, Mrs. Kershian. Uh, little Kendall told a rather grown-up joke at share time. This is partially a joke, of course. It's funny in a dark way to develop these henchmen, to remind the audience that they too are people just as complex as us, and then to revert to the standard trope of expendable red shirts as soon as the action picks up. But again, this joke is not just a joke, because the fact is, this is a worker who has to kill in order to secure continued employment. Ah, uh, jeez, that's so nice. But if I did, I'd drop to three stars on Goon Review, and they say that's all you need, but once you drop below four, you're dead. It's a bit, but it's more than a bit, too. It's the episode explicitly linking the modern gig economy to its aforementioned conception of the henchman as an expendable blue-collar worker. There's a little snatch of social commentary here, criticizing the way that 21st century companies like Uber or Deliveroo have sold a new form of exploitation to the worker disguised as empowerment. Harley Quinn doesn't set out to systematically examine class or socioeconomics, that's not what this show is about, but it's aware of these factors. It plays with them knowingly, and as I hope I've shown here today, it often does a great job with these little moments of social commentary. Now, class is a broad topic, and Harley Quinn is a pretty dense show, thematically speaking, so I'm sure there's a lot of further directions you could take an analysis like this, and a lot of potential for other takes on the same topic. But that's mine, and I'd love to know how you felt about it in the comments below. And stay tuned for more coverage of other projects where Jim Rash plays a demented head of faculty at a weird, weird college, because let's just say there's more of that coming soon. Faster! My battery's only at 75%. <laughs> and if you want to have a say in what next month's community video covers, then consider joining up to my Patreon. There's a link in the description, and you'll also get access to the growing library of Patreon-exclusive videos that I put out on a monthly basis. And there's a couple of other cool perks too. But that's it for now, so as always, I'd like to extend a big thank you to all patrons on screen now, and especially Ian Fifield. Hello.